Hello everybody! If you're expecting the ultimate, all-inclusive, definitive travel log about Michigan's Lower Peninsula, this is not it. We're actually on a pretty tight schedule here. By tomorrow night, I want to be in Northern Ohio for a planned visit to Putin Bay. But don't despair. We're still going to see a couple of significant things here. First, we're going to Frankenmuth and visit the world's largest Christmas store, among other things. Then, the Henry Ford Museum of American Innovation in Detroit. I'm riding, 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 riding in my RV, my RV wherever I want to be. Because I'm free in my RV. It is going to be $8 to cross the Mackinac Bridge with my four axles, which is actually not so bad. I've definitely seen worse. Mackinac Island. Right yes, driving on the Big Mac towards the Lower Peninsula. So exciting. We are now officially in the Lower Peninsula, Mackinac City. I know what you're gonna say. Robert, you're missing all the good parts. And yeah, I know, they were all part of my original plan, trust me. But plans change. As I said, I'm on a tight schedule here, so we're gonna stop more or less halfway down the mitten in Frankenmuth. And my timing, impeccable as ever. We're here during the annual AutoFest, which is a classic car show. So the town is packed, but I called an RV park and they said they could fit me in. This is the St. Lawrence Church Grove Campground, part of the German Lutheran Church of the same name brought here in 1845 by the original settlers of the town, who happened to be from Bavaria. Even though they were super busy with the car show, he said they would find me a site, and they did. This is one of the most welcoming and accommodating group of people I have ever encountered in my travels. All right, let's go have lunch. Everybody's super nice here at this campground. It belongs to a church. Let's go to Zenders. Its legendary fried chicken is supposed to be the best in Michigan. And you know I'm a fried chicken kind of guy. Yep, all kinds of classic cars. picturesque actually the town I, I might walk this whole area afterwards mm, listen to that exhaust note take the next right then your destination will be on the left all right this is it by the way this Zenders is nowadays like a whole empire here they have a marketplace a hotel a water park even a golf course all right looks promising I love the car. Actually, I can smell. I can smell it. <laughs> Here in this waiting area, they have this mural. One of five, actually. This one recognizes the early lumbering industry of the Saginaw Valley. Red, coleslaw. Looks good. <clears throat> Onion soup. I got a beer flight because that's how I roll. And here's the famous fried chicken. I had a bar. Well, that wasn't really the life changing experience I was hoping for, but it wasn't bad. The service was great. The mashed potatoes were really Really cool to see all these classic cars. And even though I'm not going to be able to enjoy Frankenmuth here in its normal state, it seems nice. It is an honest, authentic German town with the right amount of touristy, great service everywhere. Okay, perhaps a little too touristy, but I think they're doing it right. 
Mmm, making fudge the traditional way. Listen to the music. It's very touristy, very touristy. That fudge smells delicious, though. Oh, yeah, cheese house. Let me tell you, I really wish I was still hungry. Hmm, cute. I'm gonna start heading back to the car. I just walked a couple of blocks here on the strip. It kind of reminds me of Helen a little bit in a way. It is the, the Bavaria of Michigan, of the, of the meeting. Uh, this, this place would have been nice. Brust, wine bar, and charcuterie. Seems to have a good nice ambience. And you know I'm a wine kind of guy, so I was gonna st stick the camera in there, but, but the hostess was right there looking at me. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and this seems to be like the main drag here. Yeah, very nice, very picturesque uh, town here. Frankenmuth. coffee house maybe they have espresso you think oh yeah I could use an espresso right now after that lunch yep this is exactly what I need before we continue I want to talk about Surfshark VPN and you will agree that sometimes finding internet while on the road can be a challenge be it we are in a remote area and there's no cellular coverage or maybe we are we are abroad and we don't have an international data plan for example and that's when a VPN comes in handy because when you have to connect to one of these potentially insecure Wi-Fi networks like at a coffee shop or a campground or a hotel you know you need some protection and the VPN creates a secure private connection between your device and the internet so you won't get your password stolen or your devices hacked. I mean, all kinds of things can happen uh, if, if a nefarious actor is, is eavesdropping on that network. And this will basically work on any device here on my phone. It's just an app, Surfshark. And uh, I'm in Miami right now, so I'm going to connect to the Miami server and it takes a few seconds, it connects and then it, boom, that's it. You are secure. And uh, But that's not the only feature, actually. Let's say I'm somewhere else, but I want to pretend I'm in Miami because I want to watch my Miami local game or or I'm, I'm abroad and I want to watch my local Netflix. No problem, because I could just disconnect from Miami. Today I want to be in Melbourne, Australia. It's right there at the, at the top of the list. And within a few seconds, I am connected to a server in Australia and the whole internet thinks I'm in Australia. Isn't that brilliant? Brilliant, as they say. And it has other features, so I encourage you to explore it. If you go to surfshark.deals slash myrv, I'll put a link in the description, and you enter promo code myrv, you'll get 85% off and three months for free. Now let's go back to exploring Frankenmuth. Oh, well. This is the Gonsenhausen Platz Fountain, unveiled in 2012. And they came by the brewery, but the parking lot seems to be repurposed for some car fest activity. Okay, I almost forgot about the other great tourist attraction here in town. It's the Christmas store, Bonner's Christmas store, so we're gonna go there. The brewery, as you saw, the parking lot is blocked off because, you know, they're, they're, they're get, everybody here is getting ready for tomorrow for the, for the car show. So the, this whole town is in function of that. So Behind me, you can see the Holzbruck, which is German for wooden bridge. And there is really so much to see in this part of town. But, you know, today is going to be crazy with the auto show starting tomorrow. And I really have to continue going south first thing in the morning. And if I wasn't going to, to Ohio tomorrow, maybe I would have stayed for the, the car show. But, but nah, not really. And here we are. And wow. This place is insanely huge. Believe it or not, it kind of reminds me of North Pole, Alaska, or Rovaniemi, Finland, which are perhaps the two other places I've been to that have like an over-the-top Christmas theme. Although I think this one wins the first place. Baby Jesus. Okay, let's step inside.
Yeah, over the top doesn't even begin to describe it. It is one of those places that if you can't find it here, it probably doesn't exist. Here's a little bit of a travel section, but I haven't seen anything RV related yet. Lots of different themes though. Here we have the Mexican section. I like the music section, very cool with all these little instruments. Let's check out some Christmas trees, shall we? And here's the patriotic section. Very cool. All kinds of little vehicles, but no RVs. Oh, it is quite a collection of Christmas ornaments they have in there. Okay, let's go back into town. And I think this is all we're gonna do here in Frankenmuth today. And I know, I'm not doing the town any justice now, am I? But such is travel. Sometimes you have the time to linger, sometimes you don't. And besides, with car fest going on, it is gonna be crazy around here tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to turn in relatively early today. You know, get some work done and then relax, organize my files in the computer and that kind of thing. Because I have a feeling the next three days are going to be action-packed. Well, yes, for the next couple of days, I'm gonna be hanging out with our friends, the Forries from Ohio. And I'm sure he has a full schedule planned to show me part of the Buckeye State. We are even gonna have a meetup in Columbus, the state capital. That's gonna be a lot of fun. Like a party, you know? But all in due time. First, we have to get there. By the way, this is uh, my campsite here at the St. Lawrence uh, Church. I had to run a really, really long cable, and they lend me a piece of cable to, to plug into that. Uh, it's a 20, 20 amp outlet, but I'm not gonna need the AC here, so it's gonna be fine. Beautiful grounds here in, in Frankenmuth. Well, good morning. Hmm, the dump station doesn't seem to be in the most convenient of places. Or perhaps it is me. Perhaps I am the one going the wrong way. <laughs> in any case, I don't really need to dump yet. The GPS is taking me through all these back roads and residential neighborhoods on our way back to I-75. And yes, we're going to Detroit, and then off to Ohio. We've got reservations at East Harbor State Park, which is located in an area which is also colloquially known as Vacation Land. For good reason, as you will soon find out. But first, we are so close. We have to check out Detroit real quick, right? I think we've made it, and we're only gonna do one thing here, and that is the Henry Ford Museum. And I've often said, you know, I'm not a museum kind of person, for the most part, but this one I want to see. This is my kind of museum. There's also Greenfield Village, which is supposed to be a must-see, but we don't really have the time today. We're just gonna do the museum, so let me get the tickets. It was uh, $30 in total just for the Henry Ford uh, Museum of Innovation, which is uh, really all I have time for. <laughs> it was 24 plus parking or something like that. This first section is dedicated to presidential vehicles. And what have we got here? Teddy Roosevelt's 1902 Brougham. 
very stylish. This is FDR's 1939 Lincoln. Now, that's an imposing vehicle. Well, check it out! Eisenhower's Bubble Top 1950 Lincoln. Who knew, huh? Mr. Dwight? Cruising in style in his convertible? That's a pretty mean looking face, too. Here's the 1961 Lincoln in which President Kennedy was assassinated in November 1963. And finally, here's Ronald Reagan's 1972 Lincoln. Doesn't it seem odd for a president to use a 10-year-old car, but hey. And of course, after Kennedy's assassination, all these were made fully armored with bulletproof glass. Although Reagan did have a sunroof for him and Nancy to come out and wave. Here we have two very different vehicles. On the right, a 1959 Cadillac. On the left, self-driving Chevrolet. There's a Studebaker. I really like that look with the wraparound rear window and the iconic airplane propeller spinner design. By the way, the museum is not only about cars, it even features classic neon signs. Now, here's one of my favorite vehicles of all time a 1956 Chevrolet Bel Air. How cool would it be to take one of this for a spin? Hmm, maybe I'll have lunch here later. This museum, by the way, there's enough here to spend the whole day and more. I don't think I've ever seen so many antique vehicles under one roof. Uh, and all the exhibits with the historical context. The entire history of the American automobile before our very eyes. Do you know what that is? That's the 1932 Ford V8 engine. It was light, powerful and inexpensive, which made all the difference. Here we have some imports, like the Toyota Corona back there, and these compact vehicles became more popular in the 70s during the oil crisis. Notice the photo in the back from when they reduced the speed limit to 55 miles per hour nationwide. Hmm, Dodge Omni. Illy used to have one of those. The Ford Explorer. The Honda Accord. The Dodge Ram and the Toyota Prius. All vehicles that pretty much defined a new category at the time. I'm gonna take a break and visit the diner, which is very cool by the way. I'm just gonna have something light, nothing too fancy. Just a clam chowder and a chicken salad sandwich. It was a cool experience. Let's start by the beginning. Yeah, this place is so big that it is very easy to get disoriented, so I'm just gonna start at the beginning and work my way to the other side. Check out the old Texaco gas station. And it is not only about cars, of course. The museum is about all kinds of innovations, like hotels, for example, and the invention of chain lodging. Apparently, Holiday Inn was one of the early innovators. It is a small section, but they do have an, an RV section here, camper vans, an airstream, and, a, and it's called a tent trailer. Well, I'm glad they have a small section dedicated to what we do. What do they call this one? Auto camping in style. Here we go. This is more like it. Vacation homes on wheels. 
I guess this would be the precursor to the pop-up trader. It goes on and on. Here we go, steam locomotives. I actually like this a lot. I mean, look at the size of this thing. This is the 1941 Allegheny, and it represents the peak of steam technology. One of the largest and most powerful steam locomotives ever built, 7,500 horsepower. It is just beautiful. One can't help but feel small standing next to it. From this beast, we go to the Duet Clinton, one of the first locomotives dating back to 1831. Ooh, we can go inside the Allegheny. It's kind of dark in here. Here's the Rogers locomotive, which is actually beautiful. And so emblematic in its design, it almost looks like something out of a cartoon. This one looks like the Polar Express, and we could get lost walking around all these old trains. Oh yeah, model train. Gotta love that. Check it out, this one has a camera mounted on it. Yep, that's me, waving. I knew there had to be more RVs. Here's a 1975 FMC motorhome. This one was used on the CBS News feature On the Road with Charles Curalt, in which a three-man TV crew traveled on America's back roads. It was on the air for 25 years, and during that time they wore out six motorhomes. Bluebird school bus. I think you could build a pretty unique-looking schoolie out of that one. All right, let's go see the airplanes. Here we have something very interesting. The Pitcairn PCA-2, an autogyro, also called a gyroplane or gyrocopter. It is actually the predecessor to the modern helicopter. Here's what is said to be the first plane to reach the North Pole, which happened in 1926. Here they also have a replica of the Wright Brothers' 1903 flyer. The original is on display at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in Washington, which happens to be another one of my favorite museums. A DC-3! Those planes are awesome! Amazingly, some of them are still in use, and I would love to hitch a ride on one. Here they have a pretty large area dedicated to the civil rights movement. And at the center of it all, here we have Rosa Parks Bus, which has been restored as it would have looked in 1955. There's a docent inside giving a talk. 60 to 70 percent of the bus riders back then were black. That's why the white. Why would this be at the center of an otherwise purely technological innovation museum? Well, the events that transpired in this bus are an example of cultural innovation. 
the seemingly simple act by Rosa Parks of refusing to give up her seat and getting arrested for it is what sparked the civil rights movement. Hard to fathom, this is the way it used to be in relatively recent history. There is also a section dedicated to women's rights. Changing the subject, I actually owned two of these models, the MicroTac and the StarTac. And up until the late 80s, all I had seen in person had been rotary phones. So I feel kind of old, but not that old. Here we go! Henry Ford's great innovation, the assembly line. Here's an example of a shoe factory in the 1890s. Hmm, I never knew Henry Ford was into violins. Here's a section on the evolution of furniture. There's a section on agriculture and being a city boy, I find this stuff fascinating. Here's a 1975 combine. And what is this doing here? This must belong to a different section, right? Look at this big contraption here. It is a steam tractor engine. One of these days, one of these days, I am going to make that farm to fork video, in which we're gonna figure out how all this stuff works. Of course, technology has advanced a bit. This kind of reminds me of the old carousel of progress in Disney World. And it shows what the same room would look like during different time periods. The first one was the 1700s. Now we are in 1840. Things are getting a little better. But not much better. Not quite yet, anyways. In 1890, we have a better stove and what would be running water, perhaps? Or at least access to a well or something. And here we are, in the early 1930s. We have an icebox, electricity, and the kitchen sink looks very similar to the one I had in my boyhood home. Turning technology into furniture. Well, that's cool. Radios, television sets, record players. This area is called Mathematica, and it is an interactive exhibit to learn about math. Okay. Let's see what my place in time is. The place in time. They kind of have all the decades represented. Cool, the evolution of early TVs. Some of them still look like furniture. I think we are approaching my time period. It is generally accepted that E.T. was one of the worst video games of all time. Let's check out the Dymaxion House, an environmentally efficient circular aluminum dwelling way ahead of its time when built in 1946. It looks kind of futuristic even today, like something you would see perhaps as part of the Earthship community in Taos, New Mexico. We've seen those.
Last but not least, here we have all these big contraptions. It is a 200 kilowatt dynamo. So this place is massive and you could definitely spend the whole day here. I mean, just when I thought I had seen everything, there's this new section with steam engines. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, my time is kind of running out. This is called a cycloidal engine. Wouldn't it be cool to understand how all this stuff works? It is fascinating. Time's up! massive museum here and um, let me tell you, you you could spend I mean, at least I could spend probably the whole day in there there's so much to see and I kind of rushed through it I saw almost everything but um, but it would be nice just to you know stand in front of each contraption there and just you know immerse yourself in the history definitely it it's way it's up there uh, with uh, with the Air and Space Museum, the, Smith, the Smithsonian. Uh, you know, top five, top top five of my favorite museums that you know that I've ever been. And they do that on the hour. They do like a like a. Oh, look at that. Model T. Steam train. Oh, and in any, any case, as I was saying, and, and in here they also have uh, the, the, the the factory tour. The, the, there's so much you could, you could you could spend two or three days in this place, just in this Ford complex right here. So um, we'll be back one of these days. They do have uh, ample RV parking, so. Oh. What do you say we, we drive Minitini into Detroit? Must be some kind of tour, huh? More research shall go into this. For some time now, I've heard accounts that parts of Detroit have become kind of like a ghost town, with dilapidated buildings and abandoned factories. And while I'm not gonna be able to access all that with a trailer in tow, I want to find out how much of it is still true, because I've also heard the city is slowly coming back. It is plain to see, this part of town is in a little bit of disrepair. And this is the thing. Detroit went from a city of almost 2 million in the 1950s to 680,000 in 2015. So as you can imagine, a lot of it is abandoned. Yep, lots of abandoned buildings still here on Michigan Avenue. The 
This is the Michigan Central Train Depot, which has been abandoned since 1988. The historic building, which is now owned by the Ford Motor Company, has been undergoing some renovations in recent years, and they do offer tours and have special events. The skyline has a certain Gotham City quality to it, doesn't it? Especially around the Penobscot building. I don't know, that was my first impression. Hmm, nice. There is certainly some gentrification happening around here. That's all the time we have. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna be late for my live stream tonight. But I mean, we we had to see uh, Detroit, right? Turn left onto Woodward Avenue. At least a little bit. I'm gonna be so late. Pretty cool because you can tell the city is doing a comeback. Still, a lot of um, yeah, I think here's where that zombie land building used to be. Uh, a, a lot Back of um, Fisher Service Drive, a lot of 75 SRV Road, abandoned buildings around still, but a lot of gentrification too. And I guess that's good, you know, that's a good trend. Continue for three quarters of a mile. Time to say goodbye to Motor City. Barely knew ya, but we'll be back one of these days. Now, the rest of the day is going to be a pretty tedious drive. One which I'm not looking forward to. But it must be done. Ohio awaits. And that I am looking forward to. I'm going to spend some time with our friends the Forest in vacation land. Particularly Putin Bay and then a great meetup in Columbus, the state capital. But more about that on the next episode. Until then, thank you so much for watching and see you on the road.